Thank you, Bennett. <sighs> Hello, everyone. Um, I'm, I'm really happy, excited, and truly honored to be here today in this amazing conference and this beautiful city of San Diego. And I just want to begin by sharing a little bit more about where I come from. All right, so this is San Diego. Oops. Um, and this is where Singapore is, right? And we are just one degree north away from the equator, which essentially means that we get, we get sun all year round. Not exactly like the beautiful California weather, but one with monsoon, tropical rain, and relatively high humidity from 97%, right? But this really impact the way we design and build public spaces in Singapore and the way our public life behavior is like in outdoors, right? And specifically, right, Singapore, we are located just right at the Southeast Asian region. And I have kind of zoomed in two times because Singapore is so small, right? Essentially, we are a little tiny red dot on the world's map. Um, and although we are small, as relatively a little bit smaller as, as compared to San Diego, um, but we have a lot more people, right? We have about 5 million in population as compared to 1.4 million in, in the city of San Diego. Um, and Singapore, being very lucky, we are kind of surrounded by Indonesia, right? It used to be a Dutch colony, Philippines from the Spanish colony, and Singapore and Malaysia, we used to be part of the British colony. And historically, we are very diverse in terms of it being a port town. A lot of immigrants, people coming to Singapore to trade. And according to the Pew Research, Singapore is number one in terms of the religious diversity. Being Asian, being Singaporean, we have to be number one in everything, right? Um, yeah, but that's the amazing thing about Singapore, right? And if you are familiar with Singapore, right, and this is the kind of image that the tourism board showcases what Singapore is all about, right? Um, we are 100% 100 urbanized, um, and according to the IMF, we are also the top 10 um, global per capita in, in the whole world, right? Um, and we have achieved success, right? We are a very small, a very young country, about 52 years old, but we have achieved where we are right now because of the very strong and top-down and very dogmatic governance that we have, right? But our question is today would be, how do we move on further from then, right? So I think this quote um, nicely describes the political landscape that we have in Singapore, right? So the social compact was then that the government will look after the economic interests of Singapore and Singaporeans, will listen to what the government wants, to, wants them to do socially, politically, often without question. It might sound strange to you, right, as, as Americans. So in today's more mature, divergent society, the people want to question and they want to be heard. So things are definitely changing in the political landscape of Singapore, and that's where we, came, uh, we come in, right? And this is um, the other image of Singapore, right, that you might not be so familiar with. Um, essentially, these are public housing areas where the majority of Singaporeans live. So about 90% of the population live in public housing. So public housing conceptually is um, different as opposed to the social housing concepts that you have here in the States. Um, essentially, there, there are housing which caters to everyone from different income levels. And it is a government initiative that enables um, all Singaporeans to own a home. So now let's um, kind of zoom in, right? I want to talk a little bit about the public spaces that we have in our local neighborhoods, right? So these are what we call void deck spaces. Um, uh, essentially, they are void, and, and they are meant for communities to socialize, to interact. Um, and if, if you're familiar with Singapore, um, as I shared earlier, we are very much driven by the top-down planning approach, very dogmatic. And it is kind of translated to the design of our public spaces. So you can see here, whether is it the idea of fear, the idea of a top-down planning approach could be seen through um, signages to prevent people from doing certain things in a public space, or whether is it putting up barriers or railings to prevent kids from playing soccer at the void deck, right? Um, but what I'm interested, or what am I fascinated about though, is despite all of this fear and the top-down planning approach, we do see small communities that thrive in such spaces, small scale, right? Whether is it um, a group of uncles, right, um, bird watching, whether it's a group of aunties. So in Singapore, we call um, 
senior male and, and uncles and senior female aunties. So that's how we kind of call everyone, right? Um, and aunties just hanging out in the public space, or whether is it introducing more art in the public spaces. And this is what we really want to tap on, on how can we ensure these small-scale communities could thrive amidst the very top-down, very dogmatic planning approach that we have in Singapore. So we ask, right, how might we bring communities together in shaping their built environment? So my journey, or our journey, so this was me and my co-founder back in 2010, so that was about seven years ago. And I was, um, and we were in architecture school back in the National University of Singapore. And doing architecture, right, um, we are very much engrossed about the materials, the concept, but we were wondering, why aren't we talking about the people that we are designing for, or the people that will be impacting through our buildings or through our design? So that got us curious. And if you think about it, what we did, so this was our final year thesis, so what we did was essentially very simple and very basic. We just went down and talked to people. Sounds simple, but it's one of the most difficult things anyone could do whenever you embark on a new project. So that journey of looking at the more human-centric architecture and design started about seven years ago, and we were just very curious you know, to find out more about the idea of citizen participation in the design and built, of, um, design and built environment. Um, why is even participation important in Singapore's context, it being top-down, which, which works right, for the past 50 years, but what's next for the next um, 50 years? What are some of um, the alternative models that we can learn from? What does participation mean to Singaporeans? So this led us to studying three different cities, um, Singapore, of course. We had a chance to travel to New York and also Copenhagen to learn more from them and what constitute participation, what are the limitations and challenges of participation, and how can we then bring that back to the Singapore's context, right? So when, when you have the idea of citizen engagement or citizen participation, you have things like this, right? Town hall meetings, very traditional approach. Um, maybe focus groups or perhaps design workshops. So we know that when we want to change the way we look at participation in Singapore, we needed to disrupt or change the way we look at participation. And we know that traditional approach of participation can never work. Because as a society in Singapore, it's not common for us to be, oh yeah, let me go to a hall meeting, it's fun, right? Nobody's going to say that um, as Singaporeans. Um, so we came to realize three main issues, um, at least within the Singapore's context. And I think, firstly, because of the very strong governance, the very top-down planning approach, there is a very strong reliance on the government to solve the residents' problem, whether it's a small-scale problem in the neighborhood. And secondly, despite um, living so close to each other in high-rise, high-dense, um, we, we don't really know who our neighbors are. Right? And lastly, we know that there is a desire for people to want their voices to be heard. But it's something that's pretty new. So it's, it is unclear the different ways um, one can get involved. So this is where we came in. Right? We, wanted to, we know that there is an untapped opportunity or even a potential for us to relook really the way we look at participation. Right? And we want to move beyond that. We want to move beyond community engagement to community empowerment a design approach that is less of a project-driven, but one that is more people-centric design approach. One that celebrates, in a way, both the top-down and also the bottom-up. And how can we do that? And how can we have that balance? And finally, right, and how, how can we design not just for people, but with people? And this is something that we really want to celebrate with the work that I do back home at Participate in Design. And fundamentally, right, um, we know that participatory design can be a very powerful platform for citizen participation. So we are coming in, right, as a very small um, entity, a very small group, I would say, right, working either with or against a very strong government. So we know that we needed to be a lot more innovative in terms of filling in the gaps or even valuing, value adding what. Um, has already been done in our local context. Because change can be scary, especially for government agencies. I mean, I, I don't think it's a Singaporean thing, but I think all over, all over the world. So we know as a small entity, we have 
the opportunity to fail, to be experimental, right? And we have then created, based on our learnings from Copenhagen, New York, um, a framework or systems that enables people to come together, whether it's experts, stakeholders, everyday people, to have a voice in um, conversation about things happening in their neighborhoods. Essentially, we really want to give the hidden voices, right? We tend to be left out in any kind of decision-making processes in Singapore, and we want to listen to them. We want to get them involved, right? So this is our framework of connecting. How do we connect with people? How do we understand with people? How do we co-create solutions together with the stakeholders and residents? And lastly, right, how do we then deliver a sustainable design solution? So the, here are five principles that I believe that drive our work in terms of empowering local communities in Singapore. And, and I think this is very, has very much so been the essence of what I've heard earlier in, in um, the, some, of the speak, uh, some of the sharing earlier, right? And firstly, it's about knowing that it's not just a beautiful outcome, whether it's a building, a neighborhood planning, or a product, but that the design process is as important as the outcome. Secondly, it's really about embracing a collaborative design spirit by seeing people for what they are good at, right? People might be complainers, typical Singaporean um, um, attitude, right? But let's see what they are good at instead, right? Can we have the platform or the time to be able to test, refine, and make time for reflection, especially in a participatory design process? Number fourth is to build relationship, right? We're not looking at design from the very hard, hardware-driven, but one that also celebrates the software. And this includes building relationship with your stakeholders, the residents and the people that you are designing with and for. And essentially, to go to where the people are. And lastly, we, want, we really want to make people visible. Right? especially when you're looking at a design and planning approach in designing neighborhoods and spaces where we are creating an accessible platform that encourages people um, to be able to be part of the conversation. So I will bring you through three projects which we have um, kind of attempt to fill in the gaps of the current system of frameworks of design and planning back home and um, showing different scales. So one is of a neighborhood planning approach, so it's a much bigger scale. One of um, public space design, which is a playground, and one which is of an interior space, right? And for me, it doesn't really matter the scale of the project, but really the people and the impact that we hope to achieve through the projects. So this is the, um, the very first project where we are looking at developing a collective vision for the Tampines neighborhood. So this is, uh, again, located in a public housing area in Singapore, one of the, one of the oldest, in a way. Um, so it is pretty an, um, an aging neighborhood back then, right? So we then ask, how might we bring residents and stakeholders together to be involved in the design um, and planning of their neighborhoods, of, of the living environment, such that they will build stronger ownership of the built outcome. So when we first started, right, we know that we needed to make participation fun, accessible, non-threatening, which they, they tend to be traditionally, right? So we do that through what we call a pop-up, could be a pop-up design clinic, could be a pop-up stories market, essentially going to where the people are. Right? And we also want to use graphic design as a way to get people interested. we like, oh wow, what is happening in my area? I would want to be involved in it. Right? Whether is it a flyer? Right? Can we rethink the way we create awareness about what is happening? Or whether is it looking at the lift lobby, which is where people are, um, to entice them to be part of the conversation? Right? And how can we also um, demystify very complex planning and design issues, but make it simple enough so that whether is it your 80-year-old auntie or the 12-year-old child is able to participate in the conversation, right? So our rule of thumb is always a 12-year-old kid needs to be able to understand whatever that we put out there. Whether is it a flyer, questions that we ask, um, the workshop materials and so on. So that's something that we take quite seriously. So the second tool that, that we do is also what we call a walking conversation. Essentially, you, you just walk and you talk. Right? And that was a chance to get kind of people to, to be talking about issues that we can solve as part of the program. 
right? So just some snippets of the everyday life um, back in the public housing area in Singapore. Um, it could be as simple as, can you bring me to a place where, um, that you love the most in, in your area and share with me why? Can you bring me to the area in your neighborhood where you think we can further improve um, through this project and we get people to converse, right? Um, and of course, lastly, workshops is also definitely a very good platform to um, have a much more intimate conversation together with the, re to, to, with the everyday residents, right? And the questions that we ask in the workshop is extremely important. And how can we use simple tools, whether is it street polling, community mapping, um, we have used some smiley and sad face, um, you know, voting elements, That's just to get people a bit more interested. Um, and um, using sketches as a way to also visualize some of the ideas. And these are some of the tools that we use to really give people a voice. People who then are typically not often enough being asked for their ideas um, in the area. Right? And it's just nice to see people being very excited that they are given a chance to be part of the conversation. Right? Which is something that is not as common right? back, back home in Singapore. And all of this, right? Um, we want to really make people visible, right, through data. So one of, the re one of the major reasons why we want to get people, the different voices, is for us as designers to then, to be able to understand people's priorities, their needs and their challenges. It allows us to then better understand what kind of facilities do people really want to have and why, right? Um, we know that Bioswales is extremely popular because we were kind of implementing a new Bioswales um, project in the Tampines neighborhood and we wanted to kind of get to know the feedback, whether people um, are, are, are open to this idea or whether is it looking at the different nature elements according to the age to better understand demographics in relation to the facilities that we can, we can provide for in the neighborhood. Right? Um, we want to also further understand through a participatory design approach um, human behavior, right, through a community mapping exercise. It allows us as designers to then further develop a much more, meaning, a much more meaningful um, design brief um, that we hope suits um, the needs and aspirations of the people, a lot more meaningful, a lot more purposeful, as opposed to a traditional design brief, which is just a one page, and say that, oh, let's just design one playground or a fitness corner, or three benches, uh, three benches, for example, right? But it's something that's a lot more thought through um, together with the stakeholders. So the second um, project which I want to share would be focusing a lot more on just seniors, right? Singapore, we are an aging uh, population, right? Um, and this is where we are looking at how can we empower seniors in the creative process? Like how do you get an 80 year old or a 70 year old auntie to be excited about design, right? or to be asked of their ideas? All right? um, and we were then given a task um, to look at this neighborhood. So this is again in a public housing area in Singapore and Yishun, and this is a studio apartment essentially um, catered for seniors, um, whether they stay alone at home, or whether they are a couple, a couple seniors, right? And this is a void deck space that we were looking at, and we have this program called a Senior Activity Centre, essentially providing a space for seniors to come together to socialise and um, to make friends. Um, so we wanted to bring seniors together to talk about what they might want to have in this area, right? And the idea of a kitchen, a community kitchen came about because, of course, being Singaporeans, we born over food, right? So what's uh, a better way to, to, to do so? So this was the before. So we were given an uh, empty skeleton, right? There were seniors already using the space, appropriating the space, um, but really getting seniors to be involved in a discussion. So this is the after, right? So we then created a kitchen together with the seniors, whether is it even coming out with the coats. And the thing about an interior space, right? It's not just about the hardware, how beautiful it looks like, but very much so about the software. So we actually had the workshop, in this case, right, in three, um, four different languages. So we had it in Hokkien, which is a, di a Chinese dialect back home. We have it in Malay, which is our national language, English, of course, and Chinese, Mandarin, right? And we were wondering, oh, um, and we realised that seniors are actually very busy people, right? They can't, I have no time to attend a three-hour workshop, all right? I need to go home to watch my Korean drama or like pick up my grandkids. So, right, all right, so let's, 
I have only 45 minutes for you. So, all right, so we're going to make it 45 minutes, right? Just an amazing thing to just get seniors being very interested, right? And one of the main learning things for us is that what we call the power of, um, the, power of um, the community influencer. So all we needed was to kind of convince one very passionate auntie to really see the value of the work that we do. And she then spread the word to her friends, to her neighbours, and we realised that a lot more people came down to participate in the conversation. That was an amazing thing that we can do, or we can't do on our own. And that is an amazing thing about a participatory design approach. All right, so this is some of the pictures of the end product of the kitchen. Um, and so this is a quote from one of the aunties that we spoke to, right? and she shared with us that through this, she realised that even residents who rarely appear downstairs in a public space, because seniors tend to stay alone at home, and which can have depression and whatever um, effects, they also came down to participate in this activity and this feedback session, right? We saw an increased number of seniors being engaged in the kitchen program, and also very happy to say that um, I, we saw a lot more seniors having a sense of pride. Whether is it, oh, just showing off, you know what, I was involved in this, showing off to the grandkids, the neighbours, or the children, just having a sense of pride and ownership to an outcome that they have built together. So the last project which I want to share would be of a playground, and this is one of our recent projects which was just completed about a couple of weeks ago, so it's still pretty fresh. And we wanted to look at the idea of play, play in the environment, right? And it's called the Hack Our Play project. And in Singapore, right, playgrounds are one of the most, um, a lot of high level of red tape when we look at designing a playground in Singapore. So three of the main challenges that we hope to tackle would be the first one that we realise that the current design of public playgrounds have been very much reduced to cookie cutter, right? They're very much reduced to something that you choose from a catalogue. Right? People don't design playgrounds anymore, you choose it from the catalogue because of the idea of safety, right? Next will also be the process. When we look at designing a playground, we realise that children, parents and educators, they tend to be left out in any kind of um, decision-making processes when you look at designing a play space for them. And lastly, we want to kind of expand the idea of play as not just being a playground, it's not just being an end product, but the process itself, because playground has a lot of opportunities for it to be a social space, right? So that got us on, on a journey, and we were very happy to be able to collaborate with Lian Foundation, who funded the project, and St. James Church Kindergarten. So one thing that is amazing about this project is that um, it was, we know that as designers, we do not know everything, right? And I'm extremely grateful to be able to work with St. James Principal, who are very open to relook at the idea of play. And she told us, right, it's okay, let's rethink the way we look at safety. It's okay for kids to fall. And this is Singaporean's parents, right? Everything has to be safe and, you know, protected, right? And it was just amazing to know that they are coming in, right? The educators are coming in from their perspective, from their expertise. And us as designers, we are coming in from the design perspective. And I believe that it makes the whole conversation, it, ha it makes the whole outcome and the process a lot more richer. And if you look at a typical approach in doing or in designing a playground, you have your usual suspects, right? You have perhaps your playground supplier, um, your contractor or your builder, right? Perhaps these few people. What we hope to do is that to be able to kind of open up the design process that enables different people to be part of um, the design and making of this play space, and they will learn along the way. So different learning touch points, and we are very happy that it got a lot of interest from parents, children, whether it's our volunteers, and definitely experts as well. So we got children together, so we had a crayon conversation. Well, essentially it's a focus group, but you know, nobody's going to come for a focus group, so we call it a crayon conversation. We got to understand kids a little bit about play. Um, we got kids to also prototype some of the things that they can do uh, with everyday uh, materials. Um, we, also got the, uh, we also went out to the public right, to also understand Share with, vote for your favourite play space and why. Vote for your least favourite playground and why. And this became useful data for us in the eventual outcome of the playground. We also got parents, because we know Singaporean parents, they have a huge impact in the way kids play. And we realised through this project is that um, kids, Singaporean children, they don't play um, often enough. 
we don't really play outdoors, which is, a, which is really a very, very sad um, thing that, that, that we have in Singapore, right? We also got experts, whether it's the urban farmers, artists, play advocates, to come together to be part of the conversation. We then went on to further prototype with children. So we got the educators to just put stuff out there, observe and feedback to us. And this is the amazing thing about working very, very closely with our partners, which is the uh, um, educators at St. James Kindergarten. Um, and really kind of making, using everyday materials. Something which might be very common in the States, but in Singapore, really, we don't use enough of such everyday materials. We have no tires um, in terms of building playground. It's something that's pretty new because of the regulation that we have to prevent such things from happening, right? So this is one of the ways for us to realize, oh, you know what? Crates can be used this way. Tires can actually be used for play, something that is cheap and, 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 and recyclable. And if, if you think about it, playgrounds are one of the most expensive um, things that you know, any childcare um, will need to buy to have a playground in their space. Um, again, getting kids to test and prototype. Um, and we also got them to also build the play space. And we realized during the workshop, a lot of the kids have not touched soil before. She was like, oh my god. <laughs> um, and it was just amazing to be able to let him or her to be able to experience just touching earth or touching soil as part of building a playground, something that we hope to do a lot more of um, in, um, in designing playgrounds in Singapore. So I'll share a video um, that I hope best documents um, the participatory design process. Playfulness. The principle is not really about, we're not just fixated on doing a space, although it comes across that way, but we, we are really thinking about how to encourage playfulness. in design, we came together to develop a participatory playground with the aim of redefining the concept of play and play spaces in Singapore. And we were really excited to be able to embark on this journey to reimagine and rethink how we can design and build play spaces in Singapore. And we were very happy and very fortunate to be able to work in collaboration with St. James Church Kindergarten. is really hijacking play. They are given the free space um, to construct or to just simply interact with the loose materials. We wanted to push the boundaries of play and to see given different materials, given more interesting alternatives, how children would express themselves in their play interactions. So this was something we were really interested in because we wanted to observe children interacting with materials and being creative. I just thought it would be a good session to uh, interact with the child and also having the chance to create something uh, that maybe the child will uh, feel some ownership all time to come when they play at the playground. Raven, did you enjoy yourself? Yeah. Was it fun? What did you like? The white colour paint. The white colour paint. She liked painting. Yeah. Was, uh, this is very interesting for, for the children as well as for the educators because you see the children in a, in a different way and how they come up with different ideas and how they actually had to work together because some of these things, it has to be cooperative play because you need to um, ensure that the other person is okay with you taking the other block or the other, or other chunk of crates. You know?
I think what most enjoyable was uh, not, not just uh, being able to spend time with him, but um, from the children' perspective, I think ownership because uh, he gets to really create the toys that he will play eventually. And as parents, I also got me thinking that uh, should I be buying him with so many toys off the shelf or should I be more creative and join him uh, and made all these things, which, which I think may, may, make us appreciate what we have. I think that I thought was a very good uh, takeaway for today. So um, time is up, but I'll quickly wrap up. Um, what is amazing for me is that um, we started off with just impacting or just wanting to experiment in one neighborhood. And never would I have thought that we would have impacted a lot more neighborhoods in Singapore. And for me, I think this is just the beginning of the journey. There's a lot more for us to be able to challenge, to question, to really rethink the way we um, approach design and planning in the public spaces that we have back home, right? And some of the modes that we hope to do it is not just through the PID studio where we built community spaces, but also through the PID school in, in terms of education and training and workshops, whether it's at government agencies, youth and so on. And we know that through the PID lab, we have to constantly be able to innovate um, different approach of working with people and not just for them. And really about growing the networks, whether is it working with more government agencies, volunteer welfare organization, a lot more experts, a lot more designers, we hope to be able to grow that family, that network, where we really want to embrace a participatory approach in doing design and planning. Um, one that, of course, advocates for the five principles which I shared earlier. And fundamentally, I mean, we believe that participatory design, or even human-centered design, whatever that we are discussing today, it's not only an approach to design, um, but most importantly, it's a design attitude. It's a design mindset that we have to have, right? And a shout out to my team. It's about 6 a.m. now in Singapore, um, but I couldn't have done it without them, right? For them to be able to take the leap of faith to join us or join me in this journey in empowering communities, um, empowering government to be able to work more with people and not just for them. And to know that we, uh, we are not just a group of designers, but I think we shared earlier is that we need a diverse range of expertise, whether it's a documentation team, data scientists, um, architectural designers, makers. We need all of this to make the process and the product a lot more purposeful, a lot more dynamic, a lot more meaningful. Right? Um, and lastly, right, we hope to be able to renew um, a sense of belief that every individual has something positive to contribute to the, to, um, the design process, right? And that everyone can be collaborators and not just consumers. And I'm, I'll be happy to share more with you later. Thank you so much. Um, yeah.